Hello, and welcome to Understanding and Specifying Outdoor Displays. This is the second segment of our presentation where we're going to discuss the specifications such as brightness and IP ratings that make outdoor LCDs different. So there's five factors we have to talk about, duty cycle and image retention. I'm actually going to combine those because they're directly related. If you're not familiar with the concept of image retention, we definitely need to discuss it because you should be aware of it. It is critical even for indoor applications. Okay. We need to talk about brightness. We need to talk about temperature. We're going to talk about moisture and humidity, and then we're going to ultimately talk about IP rating. And as we go through these, these are going to be terms you're going to see on spec sheets for outdoor panels when you are selecting one and you need to make sure you've got the right one for your application. So starting with duty cycle. So remember what I said about the liquid crystal structure of an LCD and how the first displays that were made to withstand more heat were built for 24-7 duty cycles. Well, that's absolutely correct. Our initial challenge was when the first LCDs were built, they couldn't run for very many hours per day. And most consumer TVs are still built this way. They're meant to run about four to six hours per day, sometimes six to eight for the really high-end ones, but that's still not a very long time. And so what happened is we figured out very quickly that heat is a huge enemy of the LCD. We always knew heat was bad for electronics. That's not news to anyone. But we saw that issue where over time displays would degrade. And so that's why every display has a duty cycle. Now, by the way, I'm going to go off script for just a quick second because this applies universally to indoor or outdoor LCDs. Always pay attention to your duty cycle, guys. Always. Okay, it's on the spec sheet for a reason. Most typical displays are going to be labeled today at 16-7, meaning you can run them 16 hours a day, seven days a week. This is adequate for almost every installation. You are going to see specialized panels that are rated for 24-7. They are designed for a certain number of hours on with a certain number of hours off for cooling and rest. If the display is not properly used, if its duty cycle is exceeded, you can very quickly, one, possibly void the warranty, that's bad news, or two, lead to premature display failure. That's also really bad news. So we have to pay critical attention, and this is true regardless of what type of panel we use. Most outdoor displays you're going to see, because of the robustness that they are built to, the temperatures they're built to withstand, they're going to typically be rated 24-7. That's pretty common. You may see some 16-7 out there, depending, but typically they will be 24-7. But you really need to pay attention to that, regardless of indoors or outdoors. Now, LCD image retention. Almost everybody's familiar with the concept of plasma burn-in right? We used to have that when plasma displays were much more common, where if you left a static image up on the screen, the phosphor in a plasma would be consumed unevenly. And that consumption would leave what amounted to a ghost image on screen, right? And everybody said, oh, LCDs don't do that. Wrong. They do, actually. It's not burn in the same way. We don't have a phosphor that can be consumed unevenly. But an LCD pixel is actually able to have what we call image retention, which the physical effect of it is it looks like burn-in, which that's ironic because plasmas died off because LCD supposedly didn't burn in. Well, if you specify them correctly, they won't. But what you have is, remember, we've got those little cigar-shaped molecules that you saw in that helix from the diagram earlier, right? And they move, they twist as you apply electrical current, and we use them to guide light. LCD pixels are kind of like lazy muscles in that regard. If you twist them partway through their range of motion and let it sit there, it's going to get lazy and it's going to start to lean in that direction of the twist naturally, even when power is not supplied. Uh-oh. That results in what amounts to a ghost image, image retention. Now, how does this relate to duty cycle? Heat is a direct factor. Most 16.7 displays are not warranted against image retention. Most 24.7 panels are. Because they have better cooling, they can withstand static images. For digital signage, that's critical, especially when we talk about outdoor grade panels, where one, we're dealing with much higher heat, and two, they're going to be used for things like, let's take a digital menu board that's used for a drive through That's going to be massively static. Yeah, it'll change from time to time, but not super rapidly, right? So being able to deal with image retention is very important, and that's just as important as duty cycle. So keep that in mind. These two things tend to go hand in hand, and if you don't believe me, check your manufacturer's warranty. They will actually talk about this. 
Now, LCD brightness is the other obvious specification we have to consider when talking about an outdoor panel. Now, when we're talking about an indoor grade panel, brightness still is important. And those are going to range anywhere from 350 to 400 nits for a standard panel. And then you'll get up to about 700 nits for some of the higher bright panels. And those work really, really well, depending on how much ambient light you have in the space. But that's fine when we're in a boardroom like the one you see on the screen. What happens when we start talking about a higher brightness environment like an atrium? Okay, just go over to the hotel over here and take a look at the atrium. That gets pretty sunny in there. Not hugely so, but pretty sunny. And you'd probably want a brighter display, right? Or think about a storefront window. Or think about outdoors. The sun is kind of the brightest source of light any of us are ever going to encounter, right? So now we're starting to deal with much higher brightness that is required. Now, it can range. And take a look here. You know, an average dimly lit room just simple candlelight can be like one to two foot candles. When you start talking about office lights, like a room like this, probably 30 to 50 foot candles. Outside on a cloudy day, we're probably 90. Full daylight, if you're not in direct sunlight, can be 90 to about 1,800 or so, maybe upwards of 2,000. Direct sunlight can get into the hundreds of thousands of foot candles, depending on your environment. You need to know about how bright the space is so you can give yourself a pretty good estimate of how bright your display needs to be. Okay, which we're going to use the rule of five to one. Now, this is not perfect, guys. It's, it's not by any means meant to be perfect because if I'm going to tell you you need five times as much screen brightness as you have ambient light in the space, I don't have a screen that's five times brighter than the sun. And if I did, I wouldn't want to be anywhere near it, let alone plug it into a power source. These things get really, really warm over time, right? So, okay, five to one, not a perfect rule. Where'd this come from? So the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers did a lot of studies in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and they set up a lot of the fundamental rules that we still use today for designing AV systems. Well, because the laws of physics haven't changed, guys. So even though the technology may have changed considerably since the 70s, the laws of physics have not. Light is still light, right? And our eyes are still our eyes. So they figured out that 50 foot Lamberts, foot Lamberts being a measurement of light that is shining back to you as a viewer from the display, is ideal for a living room, okay, which was coming at about 10 foot candles of light. Now, I know, I know, an office building is hardly a living room, and getting 50 foot Lamberts, what it even is a foot Lambert, they make calculators for smartphones if you don't work in foot Lamberts already, so heads up, but that five to one rule still holds very, very true, and it works. It's a starting place. However, a 350 nit panel is going to look pretty much black in bright sunlight. Take your smartphone and go stand outside, okay? If it's kind of cloudy, you might be okay, but you get into real bright sunlight, how good does that screen look, okay? I promise you, your smartphone's not that bright. And that's a real challenge. There's a 1500 nit panel as an example. When you deal with direct sunlight, a lot of bets are off and you need to go brighter and brighter. So you'll see some examples here, 1500 nits, 2500 nits, 3000, even 5000 nits. And look at the color increasing. Look at how much more vivid the image gets. That's really important. So that five to one rule can be used, but when you start dealing with sunlight, get as bright as you can manage, either as bright as you can afford, or if you can't afford even a 1500 nit panel, reconsider the installation, uh, get as bright as you can afford or go as bright as is available, okay? Because that's really important. Our Samsung products fall in the 2500 to 3000 nit range. You can see those look pretty darn good, okay? 5000 isn't very commonly available. That's a prototype panel. We got to talk about temperature. Again, that's kind of the other obvious one. Brightness, temperature, and moisture are kind of the three most obvious ones everybody thinks about when they're specifying a display. Temperature is an easy one. Every single display is going to have a range of temperatures it can withstand. So for example, the Samsung panels that we provide, they go from about zero to about 40 Celsius, which is 32 to 104 Fahrenheit. That's not bad, but you might say, well, okay, 104 Fahrenheit, huh? Well, 32 I get. 104, though, that's not that hot. Well, no, it's not, especially if you're in Phoenix in the middle of June. Uh, that might be a little warmer. So there are going to be instances where you do need to prepare active cooling of some sort. Humidity and moisture are relatively straightforward as well, because here we're just talking about, again, checking the spec sheet, and you're going to see a range of percentage of humidity 
almost always specified as non-condensing that you will see on the spec sheet. You just want to make sure that the humidity in the environment you're putting the display into doesn't exceed either of these. Okay, so for example, you're going to see a lot of displays that are specified about 10 to 80 percent. Now, that changes though when we start talking about IP rated panels, which I'm coming to in a moment. Dust and debris. This is an important one that a lot of people don't consider. Okay, and really, if you think about it, you don't want to breathe in a ton of dust and a ton of nasty sediment and stuff, right? I mean, we have respirators and things like that. What makes you think your displays do either? So one of the, the minor things that is frequently overlooked is making sure that everything is kept fairly clean. IP ratings. Now this is where the magic starts to happen. Okay? And this, by the way, is applicable to all kinds of different products, not just LCDs. IP ratings or ingress protection ratings are how we can rate something on its ability to resist moisture and resist particulate matter on its own. And this is a really important concept. So you're going to see it as a two-digit number. Okay, IP something. Okay, and the first digit is the ability to reject particulate matter like dust. Okay, and this is going to be on a scale of one to six. The second digit is our ability to resist the penetration of liquid. Okay, and it's going to go from one to eight. Higher is again better. Now, something that I want to point out, and if nobody's had this conversation with you, I'm sorry. And somebody has, I'm also sorry for being redundant. There's no such thing as waterproof or dust proof, right? Okay. It's water resistant or dust resistant. This demonstrates how resistant it is, but nothing is perfect. So you'll see these kinds of specifications and understanding all of these different points helps you to understand what is the appropriate display for me. So it's something to definitely pay attention to. This is all critical in specifying the displays. Now, one final thing that I didn't list as a specification, but I want to talk to you about is maintenance and TCO. You're never going to see this on a spreadsheet or on a spec sheet or on a cut sheet. Well, you might see it in marketing, depending. Everybody's going to say their TCO is the best. Total cost of ownership. Okay. One of the challenges we all run into is everybody wants it to be, I want to install it and forget about it. I never want to have to deal with it again, right? It doesn't really work. We all know that. It's technology there's going to be a certain cost in using it and maintaining it over time. We need to be able to monitor the display and understand that it's working correctly. We need to be able to make sure it's got all the appropriate inputs, possibly media players. And we want to make sure that it's going to provide a proper operational lifetime for the customer, for the end user. Okay. And I don't care whether you're someone who buys this product or you're someone who sells this product. We're all going to think about it the same way. We want to protect our investment whether we're doing that on behalf of our customer or on behalf of ourselves, because we are the customer. We want to make sure that we're paying attention to these. And using an outdoor display is risk abatement. Every time you buy a new piece of technology, it's a bit of a gamble, isn't it? Especially if you're an early adopter. It's a bit of a gamble. Is this going to work? Is this going to do what I want? Is this going to last? I'm spending how many dollars on this? And is it going to, I mean, am I going to get a year out of it? Two years, three years? And improperly specifying displays is a big increase in that risk, okay? One of the challenges, and I'm going to talk about consumer versus commercial here in just a moment. One of the big challenges we all run into is somebody going, oh, why can't I just use a basic TV that I got off the shelf at, say, Best Buy or I got at Costco? Why can't I use a Vizio? I've got nothing against Vizio. They're great products. They're absolutely fantastic for what they're intended for. I'll even talk about Samsung's consumer displays. Go check them out. They're gorgeous. Nobody's going to argue that they're not top-notch quality. They're not meant for a commercial application. So specifying the wrong product is a huge issue. So consumer versus commercial versus outdoors. I promised it was coming. I want to talk about the difference between those panels because everybody starts with a basic consumer TV. And there are lots of great consumer TVs out there. Samsung makes them. Other companies make them. They're wonderful, but they're made for specific applications. So while I know not strictly outdoors, this applies to everything, I want to do a quick consumer versus commercial and then talk about how outdoor displays are different in overall features and concepts, okay? And it'll fit into those specifications we just finished discussing. So the big question, why can't I just use an inexpensive consumer TV for a commercial installation? What's wrong with that? Why, why does that not work? Why is that a risk? You're up there telling me it's a bad idea, Braun. What do you mean by that? Well, okay. So first, let's take a quick look at, at a consumer TV, okay? They're wonderful for what they're meant to do. I'm not saying anything critical, but we have to be realistic about 
their capabilities. So four to six hours per day, typical runtime, up to eight hours depending on the manufacturer, but average will be four to six hours. That's not a long time. Every once in a while, I'll get somebody who go, wait, I, I got kids that's never just on four to six hours a day. Okay, I get it, but and they're really not expected to have a long operational lifetime. The anticipation is we're all going to upgrade. Oh, well, the new latest 4K came out, and now we're going to 4K with nanocrystal backlighting, and oh, now we're going to go to 4K with HDR, and we're all going to upgrade over time. It's a constant cycle, right? And all right, we get that. That's, that's understandable, but think about how that fits into a commercial application. Then we typically have a lot of HDMI inputs and not a lot of others. Okay. And then we don't have security features like IR front panel lockout. We don't have portrait mode. Portrait mode digital signs garner three times as much eye contact as a landscape digital sign does. That's huge. Three times as much eye contact because it's different. Uh, we don't have video wall processors. Video walls are a massive, no pun intended, application for digital signage. And we're seeing many more panels getting sold for that. We don't have touch options. We don't have any built-in digital signage capabilities. And every once in a while, I get somebody go, well, they can play media. Well, yeah, you'll have a basic media player built into most consumer televisions. But that's going to let you play photos and videos. And maybe you'll have a web browser, but not always. So you need something more advanced. The most important one is the warranty. Okay, not everyone thinks about this. Most consumer TVs are not warrantied for commercial applications. And when you put them in a commercial install, it either voids or severely limits the warranty. And oftentimes it's only over the counter anyway. And that's a real challenge. That's that risk I was talking about. We don't want to do that. So we want to stick with a commercial display. For almost every single application we're going to use, we need to recommend these. Do they cost a little bit more? Yes. Absolutely. There's a reason. Reference my comments about price versus cost, gang. Okay? So much more heavy-duty construction especially come take a look at the outdoor panel. I'm going to talk about our OH series LFDs in a minute. You can bang on that one pretty good. I mean, don't really wail on it with something heavy duty, but you can bang on that really, really, really good. It's super durable. They're built to be stronger. They've got better power supplies. They've got better electronics in them. You're going to see much better MTBF, 50 to 100,000 hours of operating lifetime, depending on the model of product and manufacturer. That can be five to eight years of operating lifetime, not one or two. Standard operating cycles of 16.7 for duty cycle, 24.7 options available. They've got many more types of input. Okay, we still run across quite a bit of analog, don't we? I know, I know we're not supposed to, it's all, it's all digital. I'm sorry, analog still works and we see a lot of it still used, don't we? As evidenced by the VGA up here on the lectern with me. It happens, right? Okay, we're gonna see much, much more options in terms of video wall processing, onboard digital signage like Samsung system on a chip, which was revolutionary when that was introduced. There's still nothing quite like it that's integrated into the panels. Full portrait mode compatibility where they're built to be cooled and run in portrait. Full RS-232, network-based controls, touch options. I could go on for a while, but then also most importantly, protecting that investment other than the long operating life cycle, three-year warranties on site are pretty standard and they're usually extendable. Now, we're on enclosures, but you're, you're talking about outdoor rated displays. Why are we talking about enclosures? Well, enclosures don't necessarily have to mean weatherproofed, okay? Sometimes an enclosure is a housing. So for example, Samsung now has a line for our OH series LFDs of stands that are outdoor stands that you can mount the display into. We have one in the booth, so I urge you to come take a look at it. Come by, I'll give you a tour. And it's not weatherproofed. The panel is already IP rated, but we need some kind of housing to actually give us something to either use it as a stand or we need to mount it to a wall, right? We're gonna need a mount anyway. So enclosures can be there for things other than just weatherproofing. Okay? And also this can provide structure for other things like if I'm mounting multiple displays side by side. Like one of the things you'll see very frequently is an outdoor digital menu board with three panels in portrait. Okay, side by side, that's a pretty common configuration. An enclosure helps provide structure for that as well since you're gonna be mounting them freestanding. So understand that even though a lot of these displays are gonna be IP rated, you may run across the need for an enclosure still.